Let me take you on a journey to the coldest place on earth and its last and greatest wilderness on a voyage to Antarctica. Hello and welcome to the third season of A Voyage to Antarctica, brought to you by the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. I'm your host, Alok Jha. On the 5th of March 2022, an astonishing discovery was made at the bottom of the Weddell Sea. Lying at a depth of almost 10,000 feet and in near-perfect condition was the wreck of Ernest Shackleton's ship, Endurance, it had sunk more than 100 years before. There to witness this extraordinary moment was award-winning history broadcaster and best-selling author Dan Snow. Dan has made dozens of TV shows for the BBC, Discovery and other broadcasters and hosts one of the world's biggest history podcasts with millions of listeners every month. He's the founder and creative director of History Hit TV, an on-demand history channel that's been described by the Wall Street Journal as the Netflix for history. With vast numbers of paying subscribers, Dan has proved a pioneer of digital history broadcasting. According to the Times, he's the Mark Zuckerberg of Spitfires, the Elon Musk of the King Tiger tank. Dan has worked on every continent, from the Yukon gold fields and Maori hill forts to the war zones of Syria and the Congo. When he's not making history shows, Dan hauls his three children around historical sites, preferably by boat. So for those who maybe are a bit sketchy on the details, just tell us who Ernest Shackleton was and what happened to the endurance. Ernest Shackleton was an explorer, an adventurer, a showman, a public speaker, a performer, and he wanted to be famous and he wanted to be rich. And he decided the best way to do that was to go and involve himself with high-latitude exploration, so go to the Antarctic. It was then the last great unshaded part, undetailed part of the world map, and there was great excitement at the turn of the century, the first decade or two of the 20th century. And he wanted to, he was very sad, he almost became the first man to get to the South Pole. He failed by about 90 miles, almost died on that expedition, came back and then someone else got to the South Pole, Amundsen. So he announced that actually getting to the South Pole wasn't kind of a big deal. The big, big excitement was crossing Antarctica via the South Pole, crossing it from coast to coast. That was, in fact, the great achievement. So he set out to do that in 1914. War broke out in Europe. He offered to serve. He had a ship. Endurance fitted out with an expedition on board. He offered their services to Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty. Churchill said, no thanks. <laughs> Keep going, mate. And so he headed down to Antarctica. He got to South Georgia, the last outpost of the British Empire, of a human settlement in the Antarctica. The Norwegian whalers there urged him not to go there. So it was a very bad ice year. The sea around Antarctica full of ice, even though it was the summer. He ignored them. He headed into said ice, hit it almost immediately, and weaved his way through it for some months. Like this was December of 1914, the Antarctic summer. And then, sadly, by the beginning of 1915, autumn, if you like, of 1915, he became entombed in the ice, encased in ice. His ship, the Endurance, trapped in ice within sight of the Antarctic mainland. So he could almost get off the ship and walk to the Antarctic mainland, but they were trapped there in the ice. So that's from late February 1915. And then they were trapped there for the whole of the Antarctic winter. Complete blackness, minus 30, minus 40, huddled aboard this ship. But the point about the ice is it moves. It moves. It moves about one knot, one mile an hour. So it's moving in this constant gyre, this great circular whirlpool-like formation in the Weddell Sea. The Weddell Sea is a bit of a cul-de-sac. The great Antarctic peninsula sticks up. You may have seen it on maps. It's a kind of big finger that sticks up towards Chile. So in behind there, the Weddell Sea, you get a kind of circular effect. So it's moving north, away from Antarctica all the time. And eventually, though, the ship was crushed. They survived on it for months, and then it is slowly crushed. The hull was shattered, and on the uh, 27th of October, I think it was, 1915, they had to get off the ship because it, because it was crunched by the ice, and they had to camp on the ice next to it. The ship then sank about a month later. They all watched it go, like the Titanic, stern in the air. 
and it slid down through the ice. And then he survived on the ice, and he then kept the rowing boats. He then begins the most extraordinary self-rescue mission of all time. Genuinely extraordinary. As the ice started to break up, as it moved into warmer water, by, by warmer I mean kind of plus one or two degrees centigrade, the ice started to break up. He had to get in the boats, then they get out of them again in them because you know there's either too much ice or too much water. And uh, eventually there was enough water they could sail through to the open sea. They made it to Elephant Island at the very limit of their endurance, broken, shattered men in these three boats. And then he but Elephant Island's this little tiny scrap of land. He then decided he had to he would have to take one of the boats with the most elite sailors, 800 miles on the most dangerous open boat journey of all time across the South Atlantic, across the so-called Roaring Forties with its gigantic waves and storm systems, and get to South Georgia, where he'd be able to seek help. He did that somehow, an extraordinary journey, which well, they survived by the skin of their teeth, several disastrous incidents, hurricane force winds, various other things. They then got South Georgia, but on the wrong side, he had to then conduct the first ever crossing of South Georgia on foot, with no specialist clothing or equipment, having just spent the previous months in a small rowing boat, so no fitness, with a man who'd never really been done any alpine work ever before. The three of them were left under the un- upturned boat. They were unable to move. They were unable to walk. They're so broken, two of them in particular. Uh, the, the, the three fittest ones, slacker than two others, hiked over South Georgia, and at the very physical limit and extremity of death and exposure, they arrived in the whaling stations of South Georgia on the other side of the island. Then started going back and rescuing various people on the way. Made it back to Britain. Everybody came back in one piece. Sadly, two of them uh, then died in the First World War, extraordinarily. But um, so he he arrived back, bringing every single man back with him. And as a result, it's been hailed as one of the great heroic adventures of all time. And it's survived, I think, because it's an adventure, from it's an imperial adventure where the opposition were not colonised peoples, were not people who did not have weapons or organisation that allowed them to take on the British. It was an adventure in which the enemy was nature, was the most appalling conditions mankind's ever faced. And so I think that's why that story endures to this day. Of all of the heroic, daring-do type stories you hear about Antarctica, and there are many of incredible hardship and um, journey and death and and suffering, I mean, Shackleton's story uh, and the endurance is possibly the most crazy and ridiculous in some respects and almost Hollywood style devastation. I mean, my first thought of it when you started telling that story was he should have listened to the whalers. He should not have gone into that ice, but that's what heroes and people of that time, I suppose, do, don't they? What got you interested in in the story? I mean, this is a story, you know, century old and told through the history books. What got you into it? Well, Alan, you are first of all completely right, is the key thing to think about with Shackleton. This is why actually I think he's a very relatable hero. He needed to be brilliant because he kept getting his men in scrapes, right? It, is, it was his fault they were there. And yes, the Norwegians told him not to go. They were in some ways unprepared for the mission they were set out to do. So he felt responsibility for getting them out, I guess. Yes, he did. And he should have done because he got them into that mess. And because he's like a shark and he's oxygen going over his gills, he'd left debts, he'd left unpaid debts behind, he'd chaos invoices. It was an absolute shambles of organisation, but he got down to Antarctica, he got to South Georgia, and he couldn't turn around. He couldn't say, you're absolutely right, let's sell back to Buenos Aires for the, and, and wait for the next season. Because he had, you know, debt collectors basically chasing him, almost literally. He couldn't pay his bills, so he had to go. So, yes, it was amazing, but he needed to be amazing to get them out of the extraordinary scrapes that his kind of slapdash, chaotic organisation skill got them into. And as a slapdash, chaotic person... I find that very inspiring. I like it. Oh, like, I can I kind of relate to it. So you relate to him and, and you fancy the fact that if you got yourself into some sort of similar scrape, you might be able to push through the ice. And in fact, we'll talk about your expedition later. Well, Alec, you've, you've also very cleverly identified the problem <laughs> with my theory is that yeah, I, I, you know, I, I identify with his kind of slapdash, chaotic nature. Whether I'm like as iron hard as him and can do it, uh, sadly, probably not. So I get all the, all the disadvantages and all the advantages. I mean, I, for me, this is a story that I, I've known since childhood. I love, I love boats, I love sailing. I come from a very nautical family and it's one of the kind of it's yeah it's one of those touchstones one of those stories that we my grandma would have told me and the images i think the images are very important i think of the lesson from history is if you want people to remember you make sure you get a good photographer and kids know that kids know that right you look at instagram tiktok you know it's not if you don't post it, it hasn't happened and so i think there are extraordinary adventures and moments in antarctic history as you say this one was brilliantly chronicled First of all, by Shackleton wrote a ripping yarn when he came back, but also it was brilliantly photographed and moving pictures of it extraordinarily 
one of the first, I think, observational documentaries of all time, really, by the photographer on board, who then went on to have a very interesting career, taking some of the most iconic pictures of the First World War. So it has endured, and it's been lucky in the people that have chosen to retell it. Yeah. And so, you know, you're interested. And then when did you get the opportunity to actually get onto an expedition to try and look for the endurance? Because this is a shipwreck that's been looked for before, and it's a dangerous part of the world to go and look for shipwrecks. So what happened? How did you get onto that expedition? It's a miserable part of the world to look for shipwrecks. It's incredibly inhospitable, the Weddell Sea, for reasons I mentioned. The Antarctic has millions of square miles of sea ice around it in the winter. That shrinks to a very um, a very small amount of ice relatively in the Antarctic summer, but nearly all of that ice is to be found in the Weddell Sea because of those centrifugal forces that I mentioned before. So you get back up, you get multi-year sea ice, thick, nasty, crusty sea ice, three, four metres thick. And so it is a difficult place to look under the water. The surface is less than minus 1.8 degrees centigrade. That's the point at which salt water freezes. So the the sea bottom's kind of a degree, minus degree, or just hovering below zero. It's a very difficult place. But I, you know, obviously it's it's one of the great shipwrecks, one of the great stories, and it's people have been desperate to find it. I I got a phone call, incredibly privileged. I got a phone call standing on a station platform, I'll never forget it. And it's just someone goes, we're thinking of launching an expedition to go and find endurance. They said, actually... um, you know, do you want to see if the BBC or Discovery Channel wants to come and make a documentary about it? And I said, hold on a second, hold on a second. (laughs) There's been some changes in the media landscape since you may have last checked in on it. And I talked to them, I enthused massively about podcasts and YouTube and TikTok and all the things that I've been doing that enabled us to actually reach more people than an old-fashioned broadcast and also control the story in a way and ask to do more education, school groups, etc. So it was a really exciting project, obviously for me as a lover of history and wanted to go to Antarctica all my life. And and I wanted to take sea voyages across the Southern Ocean. I mean, that was, you know, in a nice big safe ship. That was an, it was an extraordinary thing to do. That for me was a highlight as well. So it was a dream come true in that phone call. How long did it take you to decide to say yes when you were well, on the station yes. platform? Immediately, obviously. But you didn't let them finish the sentence. I played hardball. <laughs> I really played hardball. It's like, well, I'm coming. You don't have to pay me, but I'm coming. So, um, I've never been a fantastic... I may be like Shackleton, who can say? I've never been a great business person. Well, I mean, why do you think that looking for this ship, you know, g- given that we know a lot about the story of Shackleton in books and all of that, is so important? Especially when, you know, it was actually relatively successful in terms of the people all came back. It's an incredible story. But why do you think that finding the ship was important in, in all of that? You know, well, I've wrestled with this, Alec, and particularly well, Russia invaded Ukraine while we were out there. There was so much suffering, sent gas prices to the roof, the the cost of living crisis that we're now in the middle of became very clear that was going to afflict everybody, there was going to be difficult decisions to be made and public services. And then we're out there like basically blasting money on trying to find a hundred year old, hundred and something year old shipwreck. And that's something that was very, I, I wrestled with that all the time. And the only thing I've been able to come up with is that it's like art. Art is pointless, totally pointless, and yet magnificent you know and I look at a Turner painting and I see something that doesn't put food in anyone's mouth I see something that doesn't have a practical purpose doesn't help me plow a field or cure a disease and yet it's something that's so magical and it's what we do as humans we have developed that ability to go beyond the day-to-day subsistence and survival and it's things like coming together in an international team of scientists and archaeologists and seafarers to try and find a shipwreck and broadcast those pictures around the world and bring extraordinary happiness to people's lives. I can't explain why, but they did. You know, where the day we broadcast those extraordinary pictures from the seabed around the world. I've I've been doing this 20 years. I've never had a moment like that. People getting in touch, young people, school kids, teachers, people all over the world saying this has brought some light to their day. It put a smile on their face at the start of the day. And that's what it is. On our ship, we had the first ever Zulu, black African ice pilot ever. He was in charge of the expedition, Captain Olish Bengu. We had a Russian on board, Russian scientist. We had Germans, we had people from the US. We had people from nearly every continent working together to show what humans can do when they work together, when they use science, when they push the frontiers of what's possible. Do I think that was worthwhile? Yes, I do. And do I think that those images brought some light into people's lives at a particularly a dark time? Yeah, I do. And I think it was worthwhile. And I think we should be allowed to celebrate things like this and celebrate the teams that kind of put those projects together. I totally agree with you, actually. And I think that, you know, I don't think anyone listening to this necessarily would think that an expedition like this shouldn't happen at all. I I feel like 
your analogy with art is very apt. It's like um, high art or culture, like opera, for example. Again, it's kind of pointless, but it's beautiful. And it shows you what humans can do at the extremes of their abilities. And I sometimes, in my own work, Often people ask me, what's the point of sending a probe into space or a particle physics experiment that costs 3 billion euro or something over 10 years to understand what particles are made of? Why why does that matter? And you think, well, it kind of, your life's not going to get better with either of those things, but it shows you absolute ingenuity and physical and mental capabilities of humans. And that's kind of something special, I think, and pushes you forward in your own life. Even if all your life is just picking up the kids and doing very boring things, it makes it slightly better, I think. Someone just wrote a note to us, or it was a Twitter conversation or something, and and, and someone was like, I can't believe you're doing this when all the bad things going on in the world, how can you be doing this? And someone just wrote back simply, it's moments like this that allow us to kind of survive the bad things. You know, our lives are difficult. They're a grind, you the kids and putting food on the table and heating our houses. Maybe it's that Turner painting. Maybe it's that listening to that opera. Maybe it's news from Mars. You know, the Mars rover I'm obsessed by. And maybe it's news from the seabed that just makes you go, oh, it's not too bad. You know, it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah. it's exciting. I can't remember which famous scientist. It could have been Feynman or maybe it was Einstein. I, it, the, the answer that they gave to a question like this, which is, you know, none of this stuff saves the world. It just makes the world worth saving. <laughs> That's all. That's lovely. You it's know? a lovely way yeah. of saying it. Thank you. I'm going to steal that. Okay, let's take us down on your journey to Antarctica. So take me through how you got there. You said you sailed across the Southern Ocean, which I personally, from experience, I know is one of the worst journeys in the world. And so what was it like? How did you get to Antarctica? Well, that was the exciting thing. We went in this massive Finnish-built South African ice-breaking ship with a South African crew on board. And we went across the Southern Ocean, dodging gigantic low-pressure systems using the two members of the South African Weather Service that were on board embedded with us, steering us between these gigantic lows, deep depressions, which would have whipped up waves to 30 feet, 40 feet, and caused damage on board the ship, potentially. So we jinked across the Southern Ocean in between these um, systems, but we did catch the edge of some of them, and the waves were gigantic. I mean, I've sailed all my life, and, and I've always wanted to see the Southern Ocean. Having seen it, actually, it it blew my mind. I came away with absolutely no idea how Shackleton crossed that in an open boat. Absolutely no idea. Like, I can't understand the physics, the mechanics by which that boat survived in those seas and the conditions that they had. So it, that was an extraordinary experience. And we were on a gigantic steel icebreaker, you know, state of the art. So for me, that was a really special and interesting part of the journey in, in its own right. And then you come to the ice, you see this jagged, frontier of ice, grey, low-lying ice on the horizon, and then you get into it, and then the boat, the ship turns into a a land mammal. It starts lifting up and crunching through the ice, it starts ice breaking, it's like a skidoo. You're on solid material most of the time, rather than being at sea, it's very weird. So all of that combined to make it a fascinating expedition, and then of course there's the various celestial phenomena down there, we saw a lot of remarkable sort of sunsets and halos and sun, well my grandpa used to call them sun dogs, Parhelions, uh, you know, where you, where you can seem to see more than one sun in the sky at any one time because of all the ice crystals in the sky. And wonderful wildlife there. The ship would always, we'd, we'd ice break and then we'd leave the engines very slowly ticking over to create an open pool of water to put energy through the water, stop it freezing up behind us. And we'd drop the drone through that hole in the ice. And that meant it was a vital place where whales would come up and breathe or and mammals, sea mammals come up and breathe. So we'd end up with lots of penguins and whales. Lots of whales would use that a hole, and then obviously seals, le- one or two leopard seals, incredibly powerful animals, and then uh, lots of other seals as well. So, you know, always something to look at. Tell me how the search for the endurance actually worked. What kinds of information did you have about the last coordinates of the ship, and how did that guide you? What, what kind of technology did you use to sort of try and find the location? Well, it turns out that the hero of the piece is a man who was technically the captain of endurance. He was sort of tracked on the sidekick. He was called Frank Worsley. He was a New Zealander who was incredibly tough, had a sort of rugged, rugged upbringing in New Zealand and sailed the world's oceans as sailing, volunteered for the expedition. We knew he was a remarkable navigator because he used a sextant almanac with the positions of various planets and sun at various times of year, various times of the day. And he had that inside his clothes, trying to keep it dry. And he used the sextant and then the tables to work out where he was on the face of planet Earth. You know, GPS, but do-it-yourself GPS. And he he wrote down where 
he thought endurance had sunk. He then kept a note of their conditions at the time and, and by judging, because of course it's not sunny, it's very cloudy often in the Antarctica. So you're having to do that by dead reckoning, by guessing how far and fast you're drifting on the ice and in between your ability to take sightings from the sun or some celestial object. He then successfully navigated them to Elephant Island and then to South Georgia. Had he missed any of those, they would have died immediately. Had he missed South Georgia, they'd have sailed off into the South Atlantic with nothing before Africa, thousands of miles away, and they would have died long before reaching it. So he is an astonishing navigator, but we didn't know how astonishing until we found the shipwreck about four miles away from the place where he thought it might be. So we searched a search area of, sort of 15 miles by a sort of box, and we didn't find it for two weeks. We'd searched most of the area before stumbling across the place where endurance lay. So just in terms of the riskiness of this operation, we've heard the story of Shackleton. You've told us how awful that was and how the weather, the conditions they faced and the danger and so on. Were you worried at any point during the expedition or even before about weather conditions, the the fact that in Antarctica you might have a plan to do something, but it's completely dependent on whether there's a blizzard that day or whether the ice has moved around or not? I mean, what kind of control did you have of the day-to-day operations? Yes, I think it's very important to say that we were exceptionally lucky. Part of the reality of climate change, of course, is there's less sea ice in the Weddell Sea. There's some warmer winters. As you know, the poles seem to be experiencing more dramatic temperature adjustment than actually even the rest of the world. So there was less sea ice. There has been diminishing sea ice for the last few years in the Weddell. So that was lucky. We were able to get to the search box in the big icebreaker and launch the vehicle, the underwater drone, off the back of the ship. There was a plan that we had helicopters on board and we would go and make a camp on the sea ice and allow the drift of the sea ice. We'd bore a hole through the ice, build a rig, lower the drones through the sea ice and hope the sea ice then drifted over convenient parts through the search area. In retrospect, that was a mad plan. It would have, you know, given how up against it we were, even when we could move the ship to exactly where we wanted it, the idea that we just relied on the ice flows to kind of hopefully go in the right direction. That would have been desperate, I think. Luckily, the ice was thin enough that we could break our way in. The ship's capable of breaking ice but up to maybe two metres, about a metre, metre and a half ice, no problem. So we were able to break our way. So when the archaeologists were like, right, let's look at the western edge of the search box, we were able to just go there, relocate, and then put the drone down in the water. There were huge icebergs, you know, bits that had carved off the continental shelf of uh, the great continental sort of ice mass. Those are big, thick, huge, you'd think, call them icebergs. Now, you have to move out the way of those pretty rapidly when they when they get pushed past. So there were all sorts of dangerous things like that. If the temperature drops dramatically, obviously the days were shortening. We were there in the Antarctic autumn. We would risk getting frozen in. We were frozen in for 24 hours. We had to you know, rev the engines. We had to do all the tricks. We had to move the ballast around, try and crack the, the seal of ice uh, around the hull. In the end, we managed to do that. So threatening us all the time was this, we may have to, at any stage, we had to bolt, we had to leave. The cold air coming in, we'd have to go. And that's what was terrifying. My horror was that having discovered it, we would have to leave before we were able to go and properly photograph it. So we'd come back with a kind of weird echo sounding game. We found endurance, but without any images of it, because, you know, that was a you know, two or three day process. That was my horror. But thankfully that didn't happen. Were there points where you thought, you, had, you know, you had flashbacks of what, Shackleton might have been going through. I mean, did, were there points where, you know, it just it was just going terribly? Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, the equipment failure was a big problem. We were stressing things to the limit. The, the drones, the Saab drones, were saber-toothed drones were operating at the very limit, past their envelope, really. They were not designed to go that deep in, in that coldness of water or, or be serviced and recharged in minus 20 up on the deck. Icicles formed the second that they lifted out of the water. And so that was a struggle. The winches, the fibre optic cable, they're not designed to be tethered to a fibre optic cable constantly, you know, kilometres of fibre optic cable. That would break in parts. We have to chop new lengths of it and then re-spool it. The winches that were responsible for kind of winching that fibre optic cable in and out of the water, they would break in the low air temperature. So it was tough. And then we did get frozen in briefly and you are just stuck in the ice until it chooses to release you. So it, there were, look, I would never suggest that I have got a sense of what Shackleton endured because actually my periods of time spent on the ice or outside, I'd lose the use of my fingers within minutes and I had modern clothing. I don't understand how they survived. I literally don't understand how they survived. But you get a little sense, a little hint of the conditions they faced, yeah. So you, of course, we know the end of this story, which is that your expedition did find the endurance. You did photograph it and the photographs went around the world. But take me back to that moment 
on the ship when you first saw the pictures? Just uh, what was that day like? And um, what happened? What was going on in your brain, in your heart when you saw those pictures? There was enormous relief, I think, weirdly, initially. The expedition hadn't been a disaster, a washout. Being an idiot, I'd sort of drummed up rather a lot of enthusiasm on various podcasts and news broadcasts and things around the world. I suddenly, so you had to deliver. <laughs> well, I suddenly could have, and I didn't think, I'm an idiot. So I'd sort of suddenly thought, hang on a minute, when we get back to Cape Town, everyone's going to say, hey, what happened? And I'm going to be, I'm going to be the guy going, um, Nothing. So that was kind of, uh, personally, uh, there was a sense of relief. But actually, the bigger sense of relief was the crew had worked really hard. The nature of embedding, as you know, as an outsider, when you embed with a team, be it on a battlefield or an emergency service, you end up forming very close bonds with them. And I realised these people work around the clock, 24-hour shifts in sub-zero conditions. I felt enormously proud and happy for them that they had done this thing that they'd set out to do. So I think it was kind of relief and happiness for... The team members. Then there was a. Well, that was the first grainy image that was shot on a, on a nose-mounted camera. We then lifted the drone up immediately to recharge it. This was when I was terrified because we identified we identified it on the sonar. We got a very grainy image of a wooden bulkhead, so clearly a wooden planking and some rivets, and we knew it was that. However, we then immediately up recharged the battery, changed the payload, put a side scan, multi-beam sonar on it, and a 4K camera. And that's when we're going to get the good stuff. So there was this terrifying sort of eight hours while the Swedish engineers like, oh, the drone's broken. And you're like, well, what do you mean? It's broken. Oh, no. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, they fix it because they're just legends. And then, but you recharge and then the sort of endless boat sort of go, oh, sorry, hang on a sec, the engine's not working. And then the ice, we're in the wrong place for the dive. Then finally you get back. I mean, like that was the longest sort of 12 hours of my life. Then by about sort of three, four in the morning, we were diving on it. And the drone was in remote operated mode rather than autonomous mode. And we were able to go right up close to the wreck and look at it and move around, fly over it, fly over it and, and around it. And that's when I saw things like the bow, I saw the stern, I saw, but you know, you're kind of... Come, and were you getting live pictures, were you? At this we're getting live pictures because it is tethered with this fibre optic cable, yeah. So, so you're getting pretty much live pictures. And there were gasps of astonishment, tears in the very small control booth where we were all standing there at four in the morning. It was a very, very, very special moment. One of the great moments of my life, really, in Korea. I, I'll never experience probably anything like that again. But and at that stage, we felt like we felt like we five in that little cabin. We were in on a secret that the rest of the world were about to find out. Millions of people can interact with what was happening there. But we were there at the beginning, and that's something that I suppose lots of people and scientists and artists and actors and politicians probably quite familiar with, but I wasn't that familiar with it, and it was really exciting. It was a very intoxicating moment where... You know, we few, we happy few. We were in there and and we realised we were part of something really special. And within two days, they were going to be broadcast all over the world. But for the meantime, it was just our little secret. Hello, I'm Camilla Nicholl, Chief Executive of the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. We work to preserve and protect Antarctica's unique heritage, from the historic huts of early pioneers to the amazing discoveries in climate science. Our mission is to inspire current and future generations to discover value and protect this precious wilderness. Every year, our specialist conservation teams head south to Antarctica to conserve and protect our historic huts. With your generosity, we can preserve these amazing sites and bring to life the many fascinating stories they have to tell. Find out how you can help save Antarctica, protect our planet and even adopt a penguin at ukaht.org or search for the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the show. Antarctica, the coldest, driest, and windiest place on Earth, where the penguins outnumber the people, there are only two seasons and no time zones. Discover this vast, breathtaking, frozen continent on a Hurtigruten Expeditions cruise. It's an adventure like no other. Explore the landscape, get closer to nature, and learn more than you'd expect with our knowledgeable Hurtigruten Expeditions team. Search Follow Your Curiosity to book now. For the people who don't know, who've not seen the pictures, I mean, obviously the pictures went around the world, but there might be some who haven't seen them. Would you just describe some of the images? And one thing that struck me when I saw them was just how well preserved the endurance was. I mean, this is yes. a, a shipwreck that's been underwater for best part of a century. And you could see the name on the back of the, uh, the bow and everything. Um, just describe the pictures for us. Yeah, so the ones that are particularly engaging are the, the brass lettering on the stern endurance and it just bright as day. The camera's able to capture that, sitting proud of the seabed. The seabed's very flat, so there's nothing to get in the way. 
Then you see basically a ship. I mean, it's it's a coherent shipwreck. It has integrity. The hull is pretty much as you'd expect a hull to look, with wooden planking along the sides, the glint of its rivets. There are a few sea creatures, um, crustaceans and things, which caused great excitement to marine biologists on the wreck. But on the whole, it's it's clean of the kind of maritime detritus that you'd expect, concretion. The water is very, very cold, so it is ideal conditions for preservation. If you think about the great Swedish shipwrecks like the Vasa, in the Baltic is the other place we tend to find these wooden ships preserved for centuries, so that's a similar sort of thing, really. And you have personal effects. You have items of clothing, the ship's bell, the ship's steering wheel, navigational instruments lying strewn around the decks. The mast came down before it sank as the ship was crushed. It put pressure on the rigging and the rope would have snapped and the mast came crashing down. But the mast, elements of those masts and rigging are still attached to the ship. Maybe that they acted like a parachute when it was sinking and it may be that they helped to stop it, smashed to pieces when it hit the seabed, for example, so it may have sort of glided down slightly slower. And then you come round the bows and the sharp pointy bit, the front of the boat, the front of the ship, and again, you, it's, a, it's a classic bow section of a wooden ship, lovely angles and curves as the um, right at the sharp tip of the bow where it would have knocked aside waves and, and sea ice. And so it is a, well, it's a, it's a wonderful site. And we've released a few images. The Disney and National Geographic own all the rest of them at the moment, and there'll be a documentary coming out soon. But there is also going to be a, well, we have the option of creating a, a perfect 3D rendering of it so people can you know, conceivably put a headset on and walk around it. That's amazing. And of course, at the time back in March, when the rest of the world saw these pictures that you're describing, and I encourage everyone to go and just have a look at these pictures because they will shock you as to how well preserved the ship is and it's almost like it's been sitting there waiting to be found i know it's an easier said than done but anyway it's an incredible set of pictures and at the time you you did a lot of social media twitter threads and all sorts of videos and everything to try and get people into the story mainstream media of course covered it as well what impact do you think that had on people's interest and ability to sort of engage with what was going on and and your own interest as a historian as well to sort of get people interested in this thing i find all that stuff a great blessing for me the excitement of this expedition was the fact that we would be really ambitious in our kind of social media and our sort of outreach strategy and in the same way that shackleton took frank hurley the australian photographer on that expedition in order to drum up interest you know it was pure nakedly commercial and you know it was designed to tell people around the world what he'd done in the same way that previous explorers had taken great artists or or literary folk with them. And so we wanted to make as much noise as possible about this. We wanted to talk about the science, the engineering, the the climate change aspects, and then the wreck, the history and the marine archaeology. And so it was amazing. We we were doing TikToks. We're doing, I don't know if anyone's ever done a TikTok live from from Antarctica before, but we did one live. We did endless Instagramming and Facebooking and all the rest of it and produced YouTube and, as you say, podcasts and we did every single thing that you can do on the social medias, basically. Talking about our experiences, talking about the ice scientists, by the way. The whole ship had a large scientific component on board who were studying the ice as, as we were looking for the ship. And so we wanted to talk about the contemporary expedition, the real-time expedition, but also tell everyone about you know, Antarctic exploration, about Shackleton, about all that kind of stuff. And the great thing about, like, we and me talking now, the great thing about that, in the old days, you had one shot, you were doing a documentary for the BBC or or CNN, and and you would have an hour, and you had to put everything you want to put in that hour and everything else, just like it never happened. You just chop it away and it exists only in the minds of those present. Now we wanted to do stuff about the science and about the engineering and about the marine biology, so we did it all. And we blasted it out on all the different platforms and had hundreds of millions of interactions. And that, in a way, was, that was the dream as well, really. What kinds of um, reactions did you get from members of the public who, who maybe didn't know much about the story but were amazed by the pictures? Did you have any particularly notable interactions or any thoughts uh, about it? If you're asking whether Elon Musk retweeted us, then the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, uh, just old-fashioned media, so print media, news media from around the world, which maybe you'd expect. We were able to, you know, it trended number one globally on Twitter. Yeah, you know, it, it was mission accomplished. We tried to get the world talking about Shackleton and marine archaeology and expeditions to the Antarctic, and and I think we succeeded. Yeah, I think a a successful shipwreck discovery, we always do that, and I think this is one of the big ones, wasn't it? After the Titanic, this is probably one of the most important shipwrecks of all time, right? And so it's interesting that it gets people's interest as well. 
I think it, it was a one of the top shipwrecks that one would wish to find. I think this is very much up there. And the fact that it was the most inaccessible because it's beneath a shield of sea ice made the challenge all the greater. Now, let's talk about the, the future of the wreck and what happens to it now. I mean, the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust has been commissioned to try and devise some sort of conservation management plan for the endurance um, so that it's protected you know, towards the future. What are the risks to the ship now that it has been found? What, what can one do to sort of make sure that it's preserved for future generations? Well, the ship is in one of the best places it could be in the world in terms of preservation. It's in sub-zero water, buried deep down, where it won't be disturbed by drag nets, fishing nets, or anchoring or recreational activity. It is obviously very, very slowly decomposing, and, and it won't be there in a thousand years' time. But at the moment, it's protected by treaty, and it's and obviously we agreement that we weren't down there, not to touch anything, remove anything, quite rightly. And so I think it'll it'll stay on the seabed. The latitude and longitude have been, have been logged with the authorities. If some billionaire wishes to go down and look at it in his mini-sub, I, I suppose he or she is able to do that. But it's, it has several layers of protection now on it, quite rightly. And I think I was actually doing a podcast the other day with the people who brought up the Vasa, which is probably the greatest shipwreck ever recovered from the seabed, so it's outside Stockholm. So it's actually just, it sank within a few metres of its harbour in Stockholm and its maiden voyage. And they say if they knew the expense and the difficulty now that they have had to go to to preserve it, they wouldn't have raised it in the 1970s, which I thought was a very extraordinary thing to say, given how popular and remarkable it is. So there's no suggestion that we could raise, nor should we, I think, raise endurance. And I guess, as you say, there'll be more science conducted in terms of trying to understand what's down there and how it sank and all of those things as well. And you said that there's going to be a 3D model one day. Is, is that happening? Is that something that people can strap on their VR goggles one day and see? We have the capability, we have the technology, we have the raw materials to do that. Whether it gets paid for and launched, I don't know yet, but I hope it does because we have a millimetre perfect 3D scan of that ship on the seabed. In terms of historical encounters for you, I mean, where does this sit? You kind of alluded to how important it is for you, the expedition, and kind of, I suppose, because you went to find it with, you know, your colleagues on that ship. Just give us a sense of how important this is in terms of the historical encounters for you. Well, for me, I think when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I dreamt about going on an expedition, just that word expeditions, you know, and I dreamt about going on an expedition with scientists and sailors and people of different skill sets and people bringing different, you know, weather meteorologists and engineers. And I dreamt about kind of going on an adventure with them and discovering something. And then I had to pinch myself because there I was, age 43, doing exactly that. And I kept thinking to myself, I think the seven-year-old Dan would have gone, all right, you're all right, old man. You turned out okay. And I think that is basically how I felt. I love history. I find it very easy to engage with historical stories and characters. I know that other people find it less easy, and for them to do it, they like to have some perhaps physical remnant of something tangible, a great image of the past. And so to be able to be part of providing that to the rest of the world, to be able to sort of help fill in a little gap that existed and, and fired people's imaginations, was just the most enormous privilege. Was it the best thing I've ever done? I don't know. I mean, I'm very lucky. I've, I've, I've met the most extraordinary people. I've met veterans of World War One, World War Two. I've met women who survived unimaginable horrors in, in the Congolese civil war and are now activists and oral historians, archivists who collect the stories of other women who people affected by war crimes. I've met people that knew Anne Frank in hiding in, in Holland. So sometimes those interactions are you know impossible to beat. But this was up there. This was this was uh, this was one of those moments. And lots of people have said, "Well, that's the highlight of your career, mate." And I'm like, "Well, like, maybe it is. I, I kind of I hope not. I, I'll be proud if it is, but I hope there's something left in the years that are left to me to match those levels of excitement." What did this expedition teach you about Antarctica? That kind of very far away, still very inaccessible continent. It taught me how incredibly special it is to have a big continent purely given over to science and a bit of high-end tourism, but effectively given over to conservation and science. And actually, we are an appalling species to trash this planet and destroyed much of the ecosystems that we've come across. And I think Antarctica is obviously, it was hostile, in, inhospitable, logistically difficult to start mining coal and all those things. So I don't think it was purely altruistic. But for whatever reason, we have managed to basically designate this big chunk of the Earth as a place of research, of study, of low-impact tourism. And I think that is really a huge achievement and very special. 
And the life in Antarctica is profound and diverse and beautiful. And the sea is full. We saw huge numbers of whales, seals, vast penguins, beautiful seabirds. They're discovering new things all the time. They've discovered a gigantic fishery, krill down there, very, very recently indeed. And of course, then you know where this is going. It also taught me that there are changes afoot. There are changes, man-made changes that are going on, heating, climate breakdown, and that's affecting Antarctica arguably more than other parts of the world. So that's what that taught me. We're incredibly lucky to have that place. Well, what else it taught me is, my goodness, humans exist in that Goldilocks zone. <laughs> Human life there is impossible. It's impossible to sustain. We, we can't live there. You know, you and me wandering around naked in that landscape would be dead within seconds. So that makes me think about our universe and our galaxy. If there are places that inhospitable on this planet alone, how hard is it? to sustain life. You know, what a, what a miracle that was, that the conditions, the precise distance from the sun, the exact atmospheric makeup that allowed the kind of temperate window that life jumped through on this planet. And that it's not other planets like Mars you need to go to to find places that's impossible to sustain life. It's right here on our own planet. You know, there's plenty of places, and but the Antarctic looming large where... Life can't survive. Sorry, some life can survive, of course, but not our intelligent ape life. And that I found sort of astonishing to think about. And yeah, I think that it just gave, again, just gave me a wonderful sense of the wilderness and the size and the scale of this planet. And we need to do what we can to protect it, folks. Just two more questions to finish. If you could take just one object to Antarctica with you, say, say you're going again on another expedition. If you could take one object, what would that object be? Well... A good book. Got to take a book. Lots of sitting around. I was lucky. I really made a decision. I thought, it's a great opportunity. I'm not... <laughs> I'd have to look after my kids. I'm not at home. I'd have to do the DIY, whatever it might be. So I, just, I took loads of books. I tried to read as much as I've read, I think, since the invention of the internet. And I read loads and loads of classic paperbacks I've never read. And I had a, a really wonderful, very special time doing that. So I would take a book. I'd take a big old book. And because you're going to spend a lot of time in your tent or in your cabin, just cuddled up waiting for the light to rise or waiting for the bad weather to pass. And so, yeah, I'd take a book. And it would be a book, not a Kindle or an e-book or something. I think lots nice. of other things it, in it. It was nice to have pages. It was, yeah. nice to, you know, it was nice to be able to feel the texture. Definitely. And just the final question, which we're asking all our guests, why does Antarctica matter to you? It matters to me because it's not like anywhere else on Earth. The flora, the fauna, the landscape, the sea, it's not like anywhere I've been. And in a world where many things are becoming homogenized because of concrete, because of communications, because of deforestation, because of land moving, drainage, in a world where we're creating identical landscapes. Antarctica will always be out there, its own unique self. Dan Snow, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. A Voyage to Antarctica is brought to you by the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust and made possible by support from Hertie Gruten Expeditions. To find out more about our guests and how you can support the Trust, please head to our website, www.ukaht.org, or to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to follow and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes a huge difference to us. Next time, I'll be talking to Maya Rose Craig, aka Bird Girl, a 20-year-old British Bangladeshi birder, race activist and environmentalist campaigning for equal access to nature, to stop climate change and biodiversity loss, and to ensure global climate justice, all of which she believes are closely interlinked. This podcast is part of the Trust's Antarctica Insight programme, supported by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and charitable gifts and donations. A Voyage to Antarctica was presented by me, Alok Jha. Music is by Alec Hughes and editing by James Stickland. The show is produced by Jessica Norman. See you next time.